Welcome back to Biomechanics. Today we will continue our discussion of models of viscoelasticity. Recall we introduced this three-parameter model last time with two springs and one viscous syringe element and derived the governing equation in terms of the stress and stress rate, strain and strain rate for this model. Now in order to solve the model we have to specify either the time course of the strain and solve for the stress, or the time course of the stress, and solve for the strain. And we showed that for the cases of creep, where the stress is constant, we can solve for the strain, or for relaxation, where the strain is constant, we can solve for the stress, although it took a little bit of algebra and manipulation. But what if we wanted to know the stress for an arbitrary time course of strain, or the strain for an arbitrary time course of stress. This would make the integration of these equations even more difficult. And although there are analytical methods to do that, at that stage it becomes much more practical to use a numerical scheme. For example, in MATLAB, we could easily use an ordinary differential equation solver, and all we have to do is specify the function representing the derivative of the function we're trying to solve. So if, for example, we're trying to solve for the stress given a prescribed strain time course, we could use a little bit of code like this, where here you see the function y dot would represent an equation for t dot, the rate of change of stress. Mu here is our coefficient mu double prime, EPR is E prime, and EPR PR is E double prime, and we've specified some values for those parameters. In this simple case, we've specified the strain epsilon to be a constant 0.1, and therefore epsilon prime, the strain rate, is zero. But we could input a more complex time course here, for example, a sinusoidal time course, and we'll do that. So now we just have to formulate an equation for t dot. And so t dot, which we've written here as y dot, will be this term here, which we've defined as the right-hand side. So you see it's E prime times E double prime, E PR PR, times epsilon, the strain, plus E PR times mu times epsilon prime. So that's the right-hand side. Then Y dot is therefore the right-hand side minus this term here, which is E prime plus E prime E prime times T, which in this example we've called Y our dependent variable. And then, of course, we have to divide the whole thing by mu double prime, which is called mu here in this code. So that's it. We have written this little function, y dot, that returns the derivative of the stress as a function of time and the stress value t, given a prescribed right-hand side from the time course of the strain. And then all we need to do is call uh, an appropriate ordinary differential equation solver in MATLAB to get a solution. Then we'll go back and we'll change the input time course of strain and look at a different problem. So let's open up MATLAB and see what happens. So here we are in MATLAB. Here's the function y dot that we just saw for the derivative of the stress and the prescribed strain problem for this three element model. The parameters are E prime is 2 megapascals, E double prime is 1.5 megapascals, and mu is 1000 megapascal seconds. Epsilon, the constant strain, is 0 0.1, and so therefore its derivative, epsilon dot, is 0. We have a little function here that will solve the differential equation using the ODE solver OD23 for a prescribed time span and initial condition, in this case initial stress, and then plot it. And then another little function here that we'll call that for a prescribed end time starting at zero and a prescribed initial stress. So now let's think about what the appropriate inputs would be. If our step and strain is 0 0.1, then our initial stress will be 0 0.1 times the instantaneous elastic modulus. In this model, the series spring with the modulus E prime of 2 is the instantaneous elasticity of this model because instantaneously all the strain will be in that first spring because it takes time for the 
syringe to displace. So therefore, E0, the instantaneous elastic modulus, will just be E prime, which is two megapascals. Therefore, our initial stress will be 0 0.2 megapascals. Now, the time constant for this model, if you recall the analytic solution from last time, was mu prime over E prime plus E double prime. So that's 1,000 over 2 plus 1.5. So that's 1,000 over 3.5, or about 300 seconds. So if we solve this for, say, three time constants, then we should see it fairly well relaxed by the last time step. So let's call so let's call IIIVM underscore step for 1,000 seconds with an initial stress of 0 0.2. So there's our solution. You can see a decaying exponential. It's almost uh, asymptotic after 1,000 seconds. So you can use this code, which I'll post on the course website, to experiment with different values of parameters and perhaps rearrange it so that instead of solving for stress, you solve for strain and prescribe the stress. And so you could get, for example, the creep solution. Now we also have a variation on this model here where the only difference is that the input strain this time is a sine wave with an amplitude of 0.1. So therefore the derivative of the strain, epsilon dot, is 0.1 times the cosine of t. So the period of this harmonic strain oscillation is two pi seconds. So now let's solve this model using this time, a time scale of a few periods, so say 20 seconds, and the initial stress will be equal to the instantaneous modulus times the initial strain. Well, the initial strain will be 0.1 times sine of zero, which is zero, so our initial stress is zero. And here we see the important result that for a harmonic input in a viscoelastic model, such as a harmonic strain input, we get a harmonic stress output. Namely, if you put in a sinusoidal strain or stress to drive a viscoelastic model, you'll get out a sinusoidal stress or strain. And the only difference will be the amplitude and the phase. Now, this is a property of all linear viscoelastic models that for harmonic inputs, you get harmonic outputs. In real tissues, which have nonlinear elasticity, the output isn't perfectly harmonic, but it turns out that for small strain amplitudes, an oscillating sinusoidal strain input will give a fairly close to sinusoidal stress output. So again, we can use this model uh, to explore particularly how the stress response changes as the frequency of loading changes. Okay, so let's summarize what we've learned about linear viscoelastic models. For the three linear viscoelastic models, we saw creep functions that look like this. In the case of the Maxwell fluid, the model deforms instantaneously and then flows at a constant rate because there's a constant force on the syringe. And then when the load is released, the spring instantaneously recoils, but the syringe stays where it is, and so the material never returns to its original state, and that's why we call this a Maxwell fluid model. In the Voigt solid model, when we apply a step change in force, it actually takes a finite time for the model to stretch. That's because you can't instantaneously deform the syringe or stretch the syringe. The Kelvin solid model has some series elasticity, which allows it to stretch instantaneously when a step load is applied, and then to creep. And then when the load is removed, the springs instantaneously recoil and then gradually pull the syringe back to the original starting point. We can also look at the relaxation functions for these three models. And here we see that when a step change in strain is applied to the Maxwell fluid, there's an instantaneous increase in the force that eventually decays all the way to zero. In the Voigt solid, it's actually impossible to do a relaxation test insofar as it's impossible to instantaneously stretch the dash pot, or to put it another way, it requires an infinite force shown here by the uh, direct delta function, which is the derivative of the unit step function that instantaneously goes all the way to infinity. But then as soon as the step change is over, then the stress becomes constant. 
So the relaxation function for a void solid isn't very realistic. And this is one reason why we need to add some series elasticity, such as by adding an extra spring in the Kelvin solid model, which now we get an instantaneous increase in the force and then a decay, but the asymptote isn't zero. Now it turns out that the Maxwell fluid model is actually not an unreasonable approximation for the behavior of some biofluids, and it's a popular model for modeling the cytoplasm inside cells. The Voigt solid model is too simple because of this unrealistic behavior, but the Kelvin solid model has often been used to describe the viscoelastic properties of solid tissues. However, it's often found that the Kelvin solid model is not a very good approximation to the shape of the relaxation curve. And the reason for that is that the relaxation behavior or creep behavior of many soft tissues doesn't follow a simple monoexponential decay. There seem to be several distinct time constants in the relaxation response of real viscoelastic tissues. And one way to account for this is simply to put more than one simple viscoelastic model together. For example, here we combine n Voigt models, each with different values of mu for the syringe and E for the spring, together in series. Now, because the strain adds in series, the total strain in this model is simply the sum of the strains in each of the individual Voigt models. Now we've already solved the equations for the Voigt model, and so therefore the strain solution, such as the creep function for this so-called generalized Voigt model, is simply the sum of the creep solutions for each of these individual Voigt models, which only differ by their parameters. In other words, the creep function for this generalized Voigt model, C of t, is just the sum of 1 over EI times 1 minus e to the minus lambda i t times t naught u of t, where EI here is the elastic constant for each of the n elements in the generalized Voigt model, and lambda i is EI divided by mu i, where mu i is the viscous constant in the ith model. So simply by adding several Voigt models in series, we've constructed a model that has a creep function with several time constants that could therefore better match experimental measurements. Similarly, it's easy to see that if we take several Maxwell fluid models and combine them in parallel, then because the stress adds in each of these elements, that means that the relaxation function for this generalized Maxwell model is just the sum of relaxation functions in the individual Maxwell models. And so in this case, k of t, again, is just the sum from i equals 1 to n of e i times e to the minus lambda i t, this time times epsilon naught u of t, where this is just the unit step function or heavy side function. And we can, of course, do the same thing with the three parameter models and combine them. In practice, we find that many soft tissues can be well approximated not by one standard linear solid, but by two or, in particular, three. Often three standard linear solids tend to capture the combination of fast, medium, and slow relaxation responses seen in real tissues. So, so far we've talked about strictly linear viscoelastic models, where the springs have a linear stress-strain relation and the dash pots have a linear relationship between strain rate and force. Soft tissues, we know, exhibit several viscoelastic properties, including hysteresis, stress relaxation, creep, and strain rate dependence. Linear viscoelastic models also display most of these properties. However, soft tissue elasticity is nonlinear. So quasi-linear viscoelasticity theory combines the time history dependence found in linear viscoelastic models with the nonlinear stress-strain relation in nonlinear models. We call this the static nonlinearity. So quasi-linear means almost linear or partly linear, and so the time course is linear as in linear viscoelasticity, but the stress-strain relation is nonlinear. Another way to think about this is that the spring is nonlinear, but the dash part or the viscous element is linear. Quasi-linear viscoelasticity 
takes advantage of an important general property seen in linear viscoelasticity. Namely, in all linear viscoelastic models, we saw that the relaxation function, k of t, is proportional to the initial strain, epsilon naught, and therefore, since there's a linear relationship between the strain and the stress in the spring, therefore to the instantaneous initial stress. Similarly, the creep function C of t was always proportional to the initial stress T naught, and therefore to the initial strain epsilon naught. Making use of these properties, we can therefore define the reduced relaxation function G of t as the relaxation response K of t divided by the initial stress T naught, which is the same as E naught times epsilon naught, where E naught is the instantaneous elastic modulus. Similarly, the reduced creep function J of t is the creep response C of t divided by the initial strain epsilon naught, or C of t divided by T naught divided by E naught, where again, E naught is the instantaneous elastic modulus. So why is this property important? Well, it enables us to separate the strain dependence of the stress from the time dependence of the stress. For example, we can now write that the stress relaxation as a function of time and strain is equal to some function of the strain, Te, some elastic response, times G of T, which is only a function of time. So you can see by defining the reduced relaxation function, we can separate out the time course of the relaxation from the strain dependence of the relaxation. And then instead of assuming that the strain dependence has to be a linear function determined by a constant elastic modulus, we could allow that this Te of epsilon is some nonlinear elastic response. Equivalently, for the creep function, we could define the creep function as a function of time and stress as the instantaneous elastic strain as a function of the stress times the reduced creep function J of t. So again, all the time dependence of the creep is in the reduced creep function, and the nonlinear stress-strain relation is in the elastic response function. Here it's the inverse. Here it's the strain as a function of the stress. In other words, in quasi-linear viscoelasticity, the instantaneous stress may be a nonlinear function of strain, and therefore the instantaneous strain may be a nonlinear function of stress, but the strain dependence and time dependence are separable, and the reduced relaxation and creep functions are independent of the strain. So we can preserve that essential property of linear viscoelastic models while relaxing the requirement that the elastic property uh, has to be a linear one. So the question is, does this approximation actually work in real tissues? And here's an example of reduced relaxation function calculated for a real experiments in rabbit mesentery tissue. Now focus on the dark line here, and you can see that that dark line goes through these points with these error bars. Those represent the relaxation responses measured in 16 different tests in which the initial stress was varied. You can see that the error bars are reasonably small and therefore to a reasonably good approximation, when normalized, all of the relaxation responses plotted here on a log scale fell on the same curve. In other words, even though the rabbit mesentery is a highly nonlinear tissue, provided we divide the relaxation function by the initial stress at time zero, the resulting normalized or reduced relaxation function is fairly independent of the magnitude of that initial load, which you can see varied um, from 2 to 16 grams, so an eightfold range of load. So let's summarize what we've learned about linear and quasi-linear viscoelasticity. The stress-strain relation is not unique in a viscoelastic material. It depends on the load history. The elastic modulus depends on the load history too. For example, the instantaneous elastic modulus E0 is not in general equal to the asymptotic elastic modulus E infinity. Creep, relaxation, and recovery are all linear viscoelastic properties. Creep solutions can be normalized by the initial strain to obtain the reduced creep function J of t, where J at zero is one. And this then allows us to separate the strain and time dependence of the creep response and write that C of time and stress is equal to epsilon of stress 
the elastic response times J of T, the reduced creep function. Similarly, the relaxation solution can be normalized by the initial stress to give the reduced relaxation function G of T, where G of zero is equal to one. And this allows us to separate the strain and time dependence in the relaxation response and write that K of T and epsilon is equal to the elastic response T of epsilon times G of T.